Welcome to this crash course for Arx Fatalis. This video will explain the know-hows of the game and by the end of it you will have a better understanding on how the game works, plus you will progress with the puzzles much faster. This video is split into three parts discussing navigation, interaction and magic, plus there are some bonus tips at the end of the video for those who truly want to reach that pro MLG level. Navigation when it comes to moving the player with the keyboard, there are no differences compared to your everyday first-person shooter. Assuming you have the keyboard binding set to default, you can move with the WASD keys, sneak by holding the shift key, jump with the space bar and toggle between crouching and standing by pressing C. Alternatively, you can hold down X to only stay crouched as long as you have the button pressed. You can also lean left and right by holding down the E and Q keys respectively. Finally, there are also hotkeys for certain frequently used items for you to quickly access. Pressing T will light a torch, G will make the player drink a mana potion, and H is to make the player drink a health potion. For the movement of the mouse there are two functionalities, looking around and interacting with the environment. Looking around is referred to as mouse look mode, while the other is called cursor mode. You can toggle between the two by pressing the right mouse button. While it is possible to look around in cursor mode by moving the mouse to the edge of the screen, you will probably use this mode only to manage your inventory. It is worth mentioning that the inventory is not infinite, it is tiled up into a finite grid and each item takes up a different amount of space. Later in the game you will get backpacks which will add additional space to your inventory, but until then you have to learn to get the most out of the limited space available to you. It's inevitable that you do some sneaking from time to time, but it is not just a matter of you holding down the shift key, different clothing will make less or more noise as you move around based on what material it is made out of. Also you have to pay attention to the lighting. There is an indicator as part of your HUD which shows how well you are hidden. Though the NPCs and the enemies of the game are very environment aware, Me will find you. don't expect the game to be as sophisticated as the Thief series. When it comes to sneaking, your best option will always be to go invisible by either drinking a potion or by casting an invisibility spell. Walking around the maze like tunnels of arcs can get you lost in no time, but thankfully there is a minimap on the top right hand corner of the HUD which automatically expands as you explore the level. If it ever gets in the way for you and you want to hide it, then pressing M will toggle its visibility. The player has a 4 part quest book which can be accessed with the function keys F1 to F4, from which the third part holds a collection of all the maps of all the levels. Finally, keep an eye out for marked locations as you explore the game, more and more of them will get marked on your map with an X, but sadly you cannot add your own markers. Interactions there are four types of interactions in the game and you have to master them all to have a fluid gaming experience. The four interactions are dragging, double clicking, combining two items and using. Let's look at each of them. Dragging is the interaction where you grab an item with the left mouse button and while holding it you move the mouse around to change the item's location. Dragging an item far enough will enable you to throw it, which is good for luring the enemy away from you but keep in mind that the AI is scripted in a weird way, so once they reach the item you threw, they will immediately charge at you. Parts of the maps expect you to place items at specific locations which will either change the item you've added or alter the map itself. Try placing a raw fish next to a lit campfire and it will get cooked, or try placing items onto a pressure plate to open a bridge across a pool of lava. Dragging is also the primary interaction when it comes to managing your inventory. You can drag items in and out from it, and you can drag items between chests and your backpack. Additionally, you can shift click items to skip having to drag and drop, but it only works in your direction. You cannot shift click an item back into a chest or a corpse. There is a button at the bottom of every corpse or chest, which will transfer all items to you in one go. Not all items can be carried by the player. Dragging a stool for example is marked with a red X, meaning you cannot place it into your backpack, still you can use it for other things like activating pressure plates. Provisions are stackable up to 10 pieces, while other items like armor, weapons and books aren't. 
Keys are also non-stackable, but you can purchase a keyring from Maria the shopkeeper and from that point on you can store all keys in just a single space. One important feature of the game is that if you double click on the belt icon just above the mana bar, then the game will tidy up your inventory by moving items to the left side sorted by size. It is very effective and time saving when you don't have the patience to organize stuff in your backpack yourself. Speaking of double clicking, it's time to carry on with the types of interactions. The second interaction is double clicking, which can be used for numerous things like talking with NPCs, activating mechanisms such as opening doors or pulling levers, reading signs that are fixed to the wall and checking out corpses or chests. The third interaction is the act of combining two items, which is done by double clicking one item followed by single clicking on a second. Combining two items will result in either you getting a third in exchange of the other two, or the first item changing the properties of the second. Examples of combining two items are when you mix flour with water, or when you use a pickaxe on a gemstone in a wall. For the former, you will lose the flour and water, but in exchange you will get uncooked bread dough, and for the latter, you will get to keep your pickaxe, but you will also get the gemstone. Similarly to mining, you will be able to break certain walls with a pickaxe or fix mechanisms like tying a rope to an elevator wheel. One last example for combination is lockpicking, where you combine a set of tools with a chest or a door. The last interaction that you have to remember is using or replying, which is done by hovering the mouse cursor over an item and pressing either the F or the Enter key Examples of such an event are when you equip a weapon, put on armor, eat or drink, and when you use a shovel. Reading books and papers can also be done in the same fashion. Once you get familiar with these interactions, the game will pick up its pace becoming much more enjoyable, but there is one last topic we need to cover to get the most out of the game. Magic. Magic is probably the most memorable part of the game, since it is so much more than just a variety of offensive spells and character buffs to aid you in combat. You can use magic to control the lighting by igniting or dousing torches, you can thaw chunks of ice, summon chickens and much more. Magic spells are created from combining runes, which you need to draw one at a time with the mouse. There are 48 different spells in the game, to unlock them all you have to constantly keep an eye out for new runes. Each rune has a special meaning and each spell is like a little sentence in a foreign language. There are 20 runes and similar looking runes have related meanings, for example the U-shaped yok means fire, while its upside down counterpart frid means ice. To take this concept further, if a spell contains yok, then there is bound to be a spell where you can substitute in frid. The runes have the following meaning, create, negate, enhance, diminish, fire, ice, storm, life, death, projectile, communication, movement, magic, time, object, space, protection, vision, poison, and earth. You will get runes early on in the game and you have to make sure to equip them all by utilizing the use interaction. Once you have some runes equipped, you can check out what spells you can create with them by looking at the second part of your quest book, accessible by pressing F2. Spells are displayed on the left page, distributed into 10 levels similarly to how maps are shown and you can see your runes on the right page. Clicking on a spell will show you its recipe and it will draw the runes on the top of your HUD so you don't have to remember the order of symbols when casting it. Casting runes can only be done in casting mode which is enabled as long as you hold down the control key. In casting mode you have to think of your cursor as a pencil and you have to try and mimic drawing the runes as best as you can. You hold the left mouse button down to draw and let up to finish drawing a single symbol. After drawing some symbols, as soon as you let go of the control button and you have a valid sequence of symbols drawn, 
then the game will trigger the spell and you have successfully cast the spell. If you hold down the shift while letting go of the control key, then you will precast the spell, which you will be able to launch later by pressing the number keys 1, 2 and 3, and as long as you have enough mana. There are three categories of spells, instant, targeted and persistent spells. Instant spells like Fireball are activated as soon as you cast the spell and their effects are instantaneous. On the other hand, targeted spells like Paralysis require you to click on a target to take effect. Finally, persistent spells like Telekinesis last until you run out of mana or you stop it by either double clicking on its symbol on the top right hand corner of the HUD or by pressing the number key 4. Magic in Arx has the power to make you want to use it as a solution to every conflict in the game, but keep in mind that some places will prevent use of magic, so keep your character well balanced and always have a good sword on you. Mastering Arx takes time and it all boils down to you knowing what each situation requires. There are almost always multiple paths that you can take when solving a puzzle and killing is usually only needed for a handful of times. So when the trolls want their idol back and you can't get into the goblin reserves, don't start a massacre, but instead try and speak with everyone to see what is going on in the goblin kingdom and you might get just enough information to get the game moving again. And with that I hope you've enjoyed this video and that it helps you to have a smoother experience with Arx Fatalis. If you have any tips for other players that I've missed or you think is important to mention, then don't hesitate to write a comment and I'll do a follow up to this video. And as for those of you who have watched the video all the way to this point, here are your bonus tips to raise your Arx Fatalis skills to the heights of a true Northern Guardian. Try processing items and food for increased profit and for increased value per inventory slot. A chunk of raw gold is worth less than a smelted gold ingot fresh out of the dwarven forgery. Similarly, cooked food is worth more than raw food with the added benefit of you having edible stuff ready for some quick healing if you happen to run out of health potions. Processing also lets you carry more valuable stuff in less storage space. An apple pie with wine will not sell for more than a regular apple pie, but it will heal more health points, plus it will free up a bottle for you to put some herb powder in it which, once brewed, will sell for a much higher price than the bottle of wine itself. If you are a first time player looking to jumping into the game right away, then you can skip the character generation by letting the computer automatically distribute skill points for you by pressing quick generate. Don't worry, you will have ample time to study what each character trait is for and how it affects the gameplay. Early in the game you are constantly battling with storage space and money. You are trying to buy runes, weapons and better armor, but they are expensive, so you sell whatever junk you have in your inventory to get a few extra gold pieces. It also frees you up some space, so it seems like a good deal. Later on you find items which you can sell for more money, so you bring those to the shopkeepers only to realize that they have not emptied their chests and they probably never will. Don't fill traders' chests with junk when you are short of money and always leave space in traders' chests for future trades. Not all spells are listed in your spellbook, there is one extra spell for each of the 10 levels of casting. Take your time to inspect what spellcasters like leeches and snake women use against you and maybe you can steal a recipe or two from them. If you made it to this point and are ready to conquer the challenges of Exhausta like never before, then please write ready in the comments. And above all, keep playing Arx Fatalis.